Joran van Klavere, također poznat kao prestolo nasljednik Herta Wildersa, bio je poznati kritičar islama. Kao bivši član Nizozemskog parlamenta i predstavnik stranke Slobode podnio je brojne zakone vezane za islam, poput onih koji pozivaju na zatvaranje džamija, uklanjanje Kur'ana iz parlamenta, zabrano islama iz Nizozemske. Da bi ojačao ove misli mišljenja, on kao kršćanin počeo je pisati knjigu koja kritikuje islam, anti-islam knjigu. Tokom procesa pisanja, međutim, pronašao je sve veći broj pitanja koje su osporavala njegove stavove o islamu. U ovoj knjizi Joram opisuje svoje osobno teološko putovanje, razvoj koji je prošao kao čovjek, filozofski. Tokom ovog putovanja pojavila su se pitanja kao što su da li Bog uopće postoji, da li je Kur'an isto što i Bog Biblije, da li Islam uči ljude da mrze nevjernike i tlače žene. Kako se je razvio Joramov negativni pogled na Islam? S kakvim se to on emocionalnim, društvenim borbama morao suočiti? I gdje ga je to putovanje na kraju odvelo? Kakav je uticaj to imalo na društvo oko njega? Daarnaast blijkt uit onderzoek dat antisemitisme en homofoob geweld vele getieren onder Marokkanen. De legitimatie voor deze ellende, de islam. Verzoekt de regering haar angstige en politiek correcte houding ten aanzien van de islam te laten varen. En de negatieve invloed van deze kwaadaardige ideologie die moet worden tegengegaan. Verzoekt de regering de islam zoveel mogelijk uit Nederland te bannen en gaat over tot de orde van de dag. Joram van Klaveren is our exclusive guest tonight. Joram, welcome to N1 and thank you for joining. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for doing this. Such an honor. Uh, for years, Joram, you gave absolutely everything that you had to fight against a religion, Islam. Uh, you tried to make legislation to shut down all Islamic schools in the Netherlands. Uh, you joined the alt-right party that was doing that, that, that incapacitated you to do that. You attempted to close all mosques, ban the Quran, and ban Islam altogether from the Netherlands. And as a Dutch politician, you opposed Islam in every possible way. And today, you are a Muslim. And the transformation from one side to the other is just incredibly big. So this is your personal and professional way and the views that you have changed during the life. So I would like to take you back from the beginning. Uh, first of all, who is Joram van Klaveren? Uh, well, uh, Joram van Klaveren, I was uh, born in uh, 1979 in Amsterdam in a pretty uh, yeah, regular family, father, mother. Uh, I had an older brother, a sister, a uh, younger brother. We had a cat. And uh, the only thing that was not so regular was the fact that we were brought up in a pretty Protestant environment, while, uh, as everybody knows, Amsterdam is very liberal. Uh, so there was there was uh, there was the thing that was uh, a little odd compared to the rest of uh, Amsterdam, um, but I uh, I just did uh, did the things uh, the uh, normal uh, kids do: uh, play football, uh, have fun with your friends, etc. Uh, we we were pretty religious, especially when I was younger. Where we went to uh, church uh, every Sunday. Uh, they read from the Bible before and after dinner. We prayed. Um, uh, we all got biblical names, uh, we were all baptized, so we were really a pretty Christian uh, family. Uh, and I was kind of a nerdy guy, so I loved uh, to read a lot. And I read a lot from uh, the founders of the Protestant Church, like uh, Martin Luther, Swingley, mm -hmm. uh, Kelvin. And those uh, persons were pretty strong when it came to Islam, especially uh, when you consider the fact that it was, let's say, the 17th century, and there were a lot of clashes between the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, from uh, nowadays, and uh, and Europe. So they were very anti-Ottoman, but um, back then they didn't just wrote about uh, the country and power and politics, but also about uh, religion, because Europe back then, especially in Northwestern Europe also, was still very uh, Christian, very religious. So they aimed at the religion. And because of the fact that I was brought up in this Protestant environment, and I read a lot of books from those people, it 
uh, it shaped my opinion when it came to Islam at a very young age. And of course, when I asked the ministers uh, how, how should I look at uh, Muslims or Islam, they said, well, Muslims, of course, are very uh, normal people. You can uh, hang out with them. It can be your friends, etc. But when you look at their ideology, their religion, it's uh, it's from the Antichrist. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very negative and bad religion. So that shapes uh, your opinion, of course. And in 2001, uh, September 11th, so it was a kind of remarkable mm -hmm. day. It was the first day for me going to college. So my university studies started at September 11th, 2001. That is incredible. <laughs> Yeah, and and I like uh, like I said, I already had this biased view when it came to Islam. Then all those uh, prejudices and all my and this my fueled my... even more, right? This fueled yeah, your confirmed. views even more. Yeah. Yeah, it confirmed everything that I already thought. Uh, and then in 2004, there was this guy, famous filmmaker from the Netherlands, his name was Theo van Gogh. Theo van Gogh. He was murdered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah perhaps you know it. You know the story, of course. Uh, and he was uh, murdered in the streets. He was shot down. Uh, they tried to slit his throat. He was killed. And the guy who did it said he did it because of the fact that he was a Muslim. He said, well, he um, he said something negative about the religion. And I have to kill him. So I thought to myself, I already saw these people acting crazy when it came to September 11, and now see these people killing people in my own streets. So I thought, well, jihad came to Europe. So I have to do something to defend the country, to defend my people, to defend Europe against this evil ideology of Islam. And then I joined Geert Wilders' party. PVV, uh, the Party yeah. for Freedom, Geert Wilders. Uh, Geert Wilders is one of the biggest, uh, one of Europe's most outspoken Islamophobes, actually. And joining his party uh, probably gave you the platform uh, to, to do all that. Um, but like you said, you know, your opinions were shaped by the certain and current affairs that were going on in the world. And we know after September 11 how Islamophobia grew, not just in America, but also in Europe and especially in the Netherlands as well. Uh, I myself lived in the Netherlands. I was there when 9-11 happened, and I remember all the events that took uh, um, the course, uh, especially during Geert Wilders uh, being uh, in, in the parliament. Uh, you joined there, and I have to say this, and maybe <laughs> I'll probably edit it out at some point, uh, but the policies of Geert Wilders and PVV, the, the Party for Freedom, and—, and um, you know, so, some of your statements made me leave the country. It made so much division in the country. This is probably um, maybe comes shocking to you, but here I am standing, sitting right across you, talking to you and saying, you were one of the reasons why I left the Netherlands. Um, I felt that there was so much division, so much toxicity at that time. And when I heard that you converted, and it has really nothing to do with the religion, but just the way you spoke calmly, you spoke with more understanding towards other communities, towards other people, it really changed my view uh, of you. And I mean, you're incredible for going down that road that I believe was not easy for you. And can you tell me, how did it start for you um, at the point when you said, okay, this is, this is not the path that I want to take in my life? And how did it start for you taking on Islam uh, while trying to do research on it? Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very sorry for the fact that it's okay. Left the country. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, kind of, it's the first time uh, somebody uh, tells me uh, something like this. So, uh, no, it's very sad to hear. Honestly, it's a good thing. Uh, it's, it's just, yeah. it's, it, it makes it really clear how polarized uh, yeah. society is nowadays. And it started back then. So, it's, uh, I think it's a good thing. And I, sh I think you should leave it in the interview. Um, I'll do that. I'll but, do that for you, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how it started? Well, uh, of course, in 2014, I left the Freedom Party, and it was because of um, there was this discussion. Uh, Geert Wilders made his uh, made a new statement during a, a political rally. It was during election time, and he was in another city. I lived in Almere near Amsterdam, and he was in the Hague, where the where Parliament is, and he was. Um, in this uh, rally, and he said, "Do you want more or less Moroccans in the Netherlands?" And he asked. He asked uh, the people uh, in the rally, and everybody starts shouting, less, less, less. Good and he said, well, I'm... yeah, yeah. So it means that it's a very rude thing to 
Yeah, of course, but it means uh, horrible Moroccans, but even a little bit more horrible, as you know. Um, but, yeah, and, and then everybody said, well, we want less. And he said, well, I'll make that happen for you. So, uh, and I was uh, I was in my own town, in my own constituency, so to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, I, I asked him, what, what is this? Because a lot of people start calling me. I uh, said, so, well, okay, we, because we, uh, we gain a lot of seats here in my own town. Mm -hmm. uh, so they said, well, perhaps you will be in, in uh, the local parliament, so to say, uh, in the city council, et cetera, et cetera. And, they, and I said, well, perhaps uh, we have to find uh, partners, et cetera. But everybody started calling me and said, well, you've gone too far. Your party has gone too far. So what? What's, what happened? And then they told me, well, didn't you look at the news? I said, no, because I was here looking at the mm -hmm. polls in my own uh, constituency. And then I saw him uh, yeah, uh, giving this new message. And I asked him, what is this? Is something new? He said, yeah, this is something new. Uh, because I said, well, I, and back then, of course, I was very anti-Islam still. So I said, well, I am very anti-Islam, but I'm not anti-Moroccan per se, mm -hmm. because it has nothing to do with ethnicity, uh, because I know there are white Muslims, there are black Muslims, there are Moroccan Muslims, there are whatever Muslims. So I don't, I don't like the ideology. I want to fight this ideology. And uh, he said, well, uh, you have to uh, change your views. So, well, I'm not, because <laughs> this is what it is. And I thought it was kind of a betrayal because, and a lot of people don't know that, but there were also working Moroccan people, Turkish people, people with an Afghani background, etc., in the Freedom Party. And of course, those people were not Muslim. And most of the time they were ex-Muslims or they were secular or had another religion. But they were, in an ethnic way, Moroccan. Mm -hmm. So I told them it was kind of a betrayal. And he said, well, that's collateral damage. Wow. And I thought, well... It's, it's kind of crazy he to is say. Hardcore. Geert yeah, he is hardcore. Geert Wilders is hardcore. Yeah, absolutely. And and I told him, well, that's that's not my uh, cup of tea. Uh, so I said, well, I, yeah, we have to change it a little bit or do something or add something, mm -hmm. whatever, in a political sense. And he said, well, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, if you're not going to do that, then I will leave the party. He said, well, you will not leave the party. And he said, well, I will leave the party. Well, he said, he won't. And in the end, I left the party. And uh, then I finally had the time to fulfill a long-held desire. And I was writing an anti-Islam book because, of course, when you're in politics, you only are about the one-liners. Eh? You want, want to make yeah. the headlines, newspaper, uh, television, radio, etc. But I thought, so this well, was we 2017, to... if I'm not mistaken, no, no, right? No this, was, no, this was 2014. 2014. 2014. Okay. I was still in Parliament then for three years after I left the party mm -hmm. because I was like independent um, uh, uh, member of Parliament back then. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought, well, I finally have the time to write this book because I want to show people in an academic way why I think it's a religion uh, that is uh, very dangerous for our country. Uh, so I started writing the book and it was in 2014. So I was still in Parliament. And um, while I was writing the book, I came across so much information that was at odds with the things I thought I knew. But of course, because I studied comparative religion, I knew about Islam as as a concept and as a, an object of study. But I never looked at it from uh, a, a very uh, fr from the perspective of truth with a capital T. So it was not a real option for me to think, hey, perhaps there, there's some truth uh, in this in this religion. But while while I was writing the book, some doubts that I had as a, as a youngster popped up again. For example, and this is kind of a theological thing. It's about the Trinity and the atonement and original sin, like core concept of Christianity. And I doubted that as a youngster because I was, I was kind of complex, very abstract. And nobody ever gave me very satisfying answers, uh, not when it came to priests. Uh, I even went to the Catholic Church mm -hmm. <laughs> to ask some explanation. I thought, well, they're the oldest church here in the West, perhaps you they really know something. You really struggled with questions you yeah. had. You really struggled with it. Yeah. Unbelievable. And, and, yeah, and I, I, I thought to myself, well, while I'm, I'm writing this book, it had to be correct. Because if I would publish a book that was incorrect, people would say, well, the guy doesn't know where he's talking about. And it would be fair. So I thought, thought to myself, well, I have to be very uh, correct. So what I did was starting to write to several authorities on Islam. And one of the people I wrote to was Abdul Hakim Murad from Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. He's a professor. 
there. Um, and I told him who I was. I, I even put a little Wikipedia a link in my uh, letter to him so he would know who I was. So I w didn't want to trick him or something or give him the feeling that I was tricking him. Uh, I really want answers. So, and I gave him a lot of questions and he answered me very directly. But he also said to me, well, if you are uh, really want to research this stuff, this, this subject of Islam in a broad sense, uh, you have to reread all your old books. So that's what I did. I reread all my old books, start reading. And, uh, but he said, if you are rereading your old books, you also have to read these articles and these books. So he said, you can see where people in the past took the wrong turn, where they translated mm -hmm. things in a wrong way, where they add some things that weren't there in the original text, where they left things out that were in the original text. And he said, it, it wasn't always on purpose. Sometimes people just didn't know. Mm -hmm. But what the, the, the result was that you got almost two religions, the religions of the Orientalists, so to say, the people in the West who wrote about Islam, but didn't know the, the core sources and the Arabic language as they should know, if you want to say something about the religion, and uh, Muslims themselves who wrote, of course, about their religion. And he told me, well, if you want to know something about, for example, Christianity, you don't ask atheists. You want to know what the arguments of the Christians are. So there he said, you if you want to know, yeah, <laughs> you said, were you reading know, the wrong literature. <laughs> yeah, and he said to me, if you want to know more about Islam, you should read the text of the Muslims, of course. So that's what I did. And in the end, to uh, don't talk too too much. Uh, oh it no! Changed tell me, tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, it changed my perspective in such a way that I, uh, in the beginning, of course, you have the, the, the Trinity, the concept of uh, God, mm -hmm. the Father, God, and God, the Holy Spirit. And those three are one, but they're all separate persons. And that, that's the, like, so to say, the abstract theoretical, uh, theoretical uh, concept in Christianity. But when I was reading... Uh, uh, the books of the Muslims, I've, I told them, so, well, this whole Tawheed thing, this oneness of God, this monotheism, uh, is pretty logical. And I compared it to the Old Testament, let's say part one of the Bible, and it was the same. And that's what the Jewish people, for example, it believe. It goes so I thought, way back to yeah, the and I thought, yeah. Yeah, true. And, and, and then I thought, well, what? And I thought to myself, well, perhaps I should only look at what Jesus Christ said, because I was still a Christian when I was writing it. And I thought, well, I don't look at what other people said that he said, but just the quotes in the New Testament, so to say. And when I looked at him, there was this story that one guy came to Jesus Christ and he asked him, what can I do to gain paradise, to go to heaven? And Jesus said, there were two things you have to do. One and he, uh, he repeated the Shema, and Shema is like a, a kind of a Shahada. He said, there is just one God, one God, one God. And, oh, here, Israel, your God is one. That was the first thing. He said, well, if you can really believe that and act upon that, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that you should treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. Mm -hmm. A beautiful message, uh, by the way. But I thought to myself, if even Jesus Christ himself talks about this one God, perhaps this whole oneness of God is more logical and more truthful than the whole thing that I believed as a Christian. And so that, that started really changing my views on the God, the God concept. Uh, after that, of course, I, I still thought to myself, well, perhaps I have something in common with the Muslims that I didn't, didn't, really didn't like that. But I said to myself, <laughs> you well... You didn't like the feeling of what you were no, I didn't like the feeling, yeah. Because <laughs> I, in, no my, in my... This is happening. <laughs> yeah, true. And, and because I thought to myself, well, they are like, like the enemy. So you don't want to have something in common with your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> then I thought, well, uh, fortunately, they have their uh, their prophet, Muhammad, mm -hmm. peace and blessings be upon him. And I thought to myself, well, that's the big distinction between us. So, uh, but of course, I had to read about his life as well, because if I really wanted to explain why he was such an evil man, I have to. I have to give some arguments, of course, in the book. Uh, but when I was reading about him, I thought to myself, well, this, this guy, it was for the first time that I saw him as a teacher, and I saw him as a father, and I saw him as a friend, and I saw him as a statesman, and not as the, the, the warlord that, that's the picture. Antichrist person. Yeah, yeah. And the anti-everything almost when you look at the, the Western sources. And, um, when, when, and then I came across the story of Hint, and uh, perhaps uh, people know uh, the story Absolutely. better than me. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and, and Hind, Hind, Hind was the wife of Abu Sufyan, and Abu Sufyan was the, the enemy of Islam, the enemy of the mm -hmm. Prophet. And uh, uh, this girl, uh, Hind, was his wife, and she uh, gave money to a person to kill the favorite uncle of the Prophet in the battlefield, Hamza. And uh, his favorite uncle got killed. Uh, they cut off. And his she ears. wore the they... pieces of his body on her. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah it was horrible. She, uh, like you said, she wore the piece of his body uh, mm -hmm. to show everybody we, we humiliate the Muslims, we humiliate Islam. There's nothing for us. We can destroy them if we want to. Uh, but years and years later, Muhammad came in power in Mecca. Mm -hmm. So he was like like the boss, <laughs> the big boss. And uh, everybody there uh, was uh, given the choice. You can leave if you don't want to be here. And if you want to live amongst the Muslims, that's okay as well. Bloodshedding is over. We start at point zero, so to say. Forgiveness. But then somebody... Yeah, forgiven. He said, there is the, everybody's forgiven. We start over. Uh, and he said, that's the only way. And But then people told him, Hint is here, the girl, the girl that gave money mm -hmm. yeah, to, mm -hmm. to get your favorite uncle, Hamza, guilt. And uh, and I, when I was reading the book, I thought, okay, now she gets stoned, uh, head, head get cut off, or she was uh, whatever. She was killed anyway. That's what I thought I was about to read. But then... He said, well, I cannot look at her right now because of what happened, but she's forgiven as well. She can stay if she wants to. And I thought to myself, that's, that's, very, that's a big thing for me, uh, when I, because I thought he was like the antichrist. And now I see him forgiving a person who killed one of his relatives, that he can say a lot of this man, but not that he is an evil person. So that really changed my views. And then I started rereading about his life, and I read a book of Martin Lynx. It's called uh, Muhammad. Uh, it's life based on the earliest sources. Without and then, the bias now. Without the bias, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, true. And then, then of course, because this, like, this filter was gone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now I could really see the person for who he was. I saw his character. I saw the things he did. And that really inspired me and in, in such a way that in the end, I thought, well, I think he is a prophet. But of course, when I said that to myself, I thought, well, this kind of crazy. It's like, like Shahada. If you really believe there is one God, you say one he's, God he's a... and he's Muhammad is his prophet. Yeah. So I thought, <laughs> you oh, basically... uh, yeah. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> we're going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Can you tell me what, um, this uh, means to you, it's not the eyes that are blind, but hearts. Yeah, because that, that's what, and it's kind of, I, I told people before, it, it sounds a little bit like a fairy tale, but it really happened. Uh, I wrote the book and there were a lot of other books on my table while I was writing on my uh, mm. laptop. Uh, and in the end, after I, I realized, well, if I say Muhammad is his prophet, and I already believe this this oneness of God concept, that makes me de facto a Muslim. And I didn't want to want to be Muslim because I still thought, well, no, I don't want to have something in common with Islam, with Muslims, etc. So I thought, well, I put all the books away, and I put the books in the shelf. But the shelf was full with a lot of other books, so a lot of books fell off the shelf. And one of the books that fell off the shelf was the Quran. And when I picked it up, my thumb was on a page because the, the Quran felt open, mm -hmm. and I turned it around, and it was on on a page where Surah 22, I had uh, like first uh, 46 was, and it says it's not the eyes that are blind, but the hearts. And what and did I thought you feel in that moment? Yeah, it was almost like the Quran spoke to me because that really was my problem because I wrote down what I wrote down and I researched it myself. Nobody forced me to, to, to write this book. Nobody forced me to read certain books. I, I wanted to research it myself with the aim of, let's say, uh, show people that Islam was a wrong religion. But uh, it was, it, something else happened, of course, because now I'm a Muslim. But when I, when I was reading this first, it was almost like, like it said, well, you have seen it now. You know what the truth is. You you have the facts, but you still don't want to believe. So it's not your eyes that are blind. It's really... It's your heart. It's, it's, it's like blocked because you don't want it. You don't want to see the truth. You can see it, but you don't want it. And then I thought to myself, yeah, perhaps if this is the truth. So I made like a little dua. It's like a, like a mm -hmm. personal prayer. But of course, I wasn't a Muslim yet. So I, I just said, Lord, eh, I don't care if it's the Lord of the Christians or the Muslims or the universe or whatever. Uh, if, if there is an absolute truth, 
Just guide me, show me what the truth is, and then I'll follow that path. And I went to bed, and of course, no, the, the, there were no uh, golden raindrops or rainbows or whatever. It's just I went to bed. <laughs> and, uh, but, but when I woke up, I felt very secure. I felt very strong. And I told my wife, I think uh, I will be a Muslim. <laughs> After everything <laughs> that has happened, yeah. <laughs> those yeah, and, words that came out of your mouth, I can't imagine. Um, what were the reactions of your family, of your wife? I, I, I learned that your wife was very accepting, uh, but that you had a lot of death threats too, and um, that a lot of people denying, denounced you, your friends denounced you, uh, your colleagues did that too. How was that path for you uh, when you finally came out and said, this is obviously the right way for me? Yeah, yeah, it was a kind of hectic, uh, dynamic <laughs> period in my life. Uh, well, my wife was very, uh, like, like you said, she was very accepted and uh, she was very sweet. Uh, she said, well, uh, we have to do the dishes. And I, th I thought, what do you mean? <laughs> we have to do the dishes. We have to put the dishes in the machine. There's still a lot of dishes uh, in the kitchen. And I told her, well, I said, I think I will be a Muslim. And your reaction is, let's put the dishes in the machine. And she said, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I told her, did you hear what I said? And she said, yeah, did you hear what I said? I said, yeah, I hear oh, what you wow. said, but I don't get it. And she said, well, what I mean is that if you really believe that Islam is true and that's in your heart and that's in your mind and you will stay the same man for me and the children uh, as you were before, then there is no problem. Life goes on. And then we have to put the dishes in the machine. <laughs> so she was very sweet. And that's, and that's what we did. Yeah, of course, we talked a lot about it uh, later on, but that was her first reaction. So she was very, very sweet and she supported me all the way. So she was very, uh, yeah, like uh, for me, she was the, the perfect wife. Um, but uh, of course, a lot of other people weren't that accepting and uh, so happy <laughs> about the fact uh, that I what, what did Geert van Wilder say when he heard <laughs> that you converted? Yeah, he was in a live show, uh, and it was very, like a coincidence. He was in a live show when uh, when this did, it, it became like a, like a breaking like a news. <laughs> yeah, of course. And uh, he was he was in this live show from the state television, and and uh, they asked what what happened to your friend, what happened to Yoram? He became a Muslim, and he said, "Yeah, I can't believe it. It's like." And I had to laugh about it, it's kind of strange. Said, yeah, it's like it's like a vegetarian going to work in a slaughterhouse now. <laughs> That sounds like <laughs> really, Ja, het was really PCV. <laughs> Wil dus wat ja. vind je van de heer van Klaar? Ja, wat een verhaal hè. Ja, wat... Het is alsof een uh, vegetariër in een uh, slachthuis uh, gaat werken, zo ongeveer. Ja, het, het, ik. Uh, um, Ik heb daar eigenlijk geen woorden voor. Kind of strange. Uh, yeah, but of course there were a lot of other people who said the most horrible things. Who will shoot you and see you in the street. Who will kill you, or rape your wife. Uh, oh, wow. The, uh, children, we know where they are in school, etc. So the most horrible uh, psycho things were said. But in the end, I thought, well, what, what can I do? If, if there is really is someone who wants to kill me, they will. Uh, I, I cannot help that, so that's it. Uh, so I just, uh, yeah, kept on smiling and <laughs> did the things I did. And uh, well, what else can you do? Uh, and, and unfortunately, nothing, Such nothing happened. Such a thing to say. What else can you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it is. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but, but, but the, the, the hardest part of it was telling my grandfather because okay. my mother started crying when I told her. And she said, well, it's not oh. the fact that you're Muslim. Uh, I don't care if you're a Muslim or a Hindu or whatever, but um, you're not a Christian anymore. And she, of course, raised me in a Christian way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like she raised me in the wrong way or whatever. And, and of course, she said, well, uh, if you really believe in Christian or a Muslim, you believe that you go to heaven if you have the religion that your Lord has given you. And she said, well, you, you will be in paradise then. So that's, that's and, and I think a lot of Christian people told me that. And some Muslims in the beginning asked me, didn't you get angry then? I said, no, I think it's kind of sweet. Because oh. it's like soul care, <laughs> because they they are they were worried. Of course, I don't believe what they say, but yeah. they were worried for me, for my soul. So it's it's very sweet thing to say. But yes. uh, after my mother, after a year, one and a half years, she told me, well, 
uh, I still don't like the fact that you're a Muslim, but mm -hmm. I have to say that you're sweeter as a son, as a Muslim, than as a Christian. So it was like... Change. She sees yeah, the change in you. Right. Yeah. So it's very because, sweet. Because you, you are Christian, and there's no prejudice against Christians, Muslims, Hindu, what, whatever. You know, there's absolutely no prejudice. We're just talking about your path. Uh, you were born as Christian, but you chose Islam. You know, you had the, the opportunity to choose what the right way for you is. And, you know, when you choose something for yourself and you feel good in it, uh, you become the, the Yoram that you are today. Uh, like I said, in, I remember you when, when you were angry, you said the Quran is a poison and Islam is a lie. And, and I remember how angry you were all the time. And then I saw your transition and you were a completely different person. You spoke with reason, you spoke with compassion, with empathy. Uh, you completely changed, even your face changed in a manner. Absolutely. <laughs> Can you believe that? That actually really <laughs> happened. And uh, seeing you today, when you smile, it's a completely different smile than it was back in 2010, when I re remember you when you first joined. So, um, it, you know, you chose your way, and it, it's a good way. Sometimes, you know, we choose our way earlier in life, sometimes later in life, but we all have to go through trials and tribulations in order to get our path right. And you, you've been through a lot when you came out uh, as being Muslim. Um, um, how did that, um, let, let's go, let's go to the ph philosophical questions more and more into Europe. Uh, Geert van Wilders and Pei Fei Fei, uh, the, the party for, uh, freedom has, uh, contributed a lot to Islamophobia in Europe. Uh, we can take in consideration France, the Netherlands, here and there in Germany, but that part, Geert Wilders is very known as being uh, one of the main contributors to Islamophobia, anti-migrant um, rhetoric uh, in Europe. Um, do you have any regrets uh, when it comes to you adding to those negative sentiments um, during your time with Pei Fei Fei? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, what is course. your biggest regret from that time? Well, what do you regret the most? Yeah, well, like um, like I said in the beginning, I and, and like you uh, said that I said that Islam was a lie, and that was like the the core concept of what I thought. Islam is a lie, and everything else comes from this lie, all, all negative things, and of course that's not true. So first of all, uh, when I came out, it, it's it's like a very bad thing for your ego, of course, because it's kind of embarrassing to say, well, I fought Islam for 12 years and now I become a Muslim. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so, but because I really felt and I still feel this way, of course, that this is the right path for me. And uh, this really is what I believe. This is the core concept of my life. And like you said in the beginning, uh, when I became Christian, I became Christian because my parents um, raised me in that way. And I'm very grateful for uh, the upbringing and all the things they did for me. But I didn't choose my religion. This is the first time and the only time. It's I think it's the, the, the hardest and most uh, thought about decision that I ever made. And uh, that was me becoming Muslim. And it, 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 it gave me a lot. It gave me uh, peace of mind. It gave me uh, peace in my heart. And like uh, when I was a Christian, I had like this, uh, it's, it's a constant struggle between heart, heart and mind mm -hmm. because I wanted to believe something that I couldn't grasp. I, couldn't, I, I really could not believe, for example, the Trinity, but I wanted to believe it. So there was this constant struggle. Mm -hmm. But then after I became Muslim, it, it was like a puzzle. It fitted. And I thought, well, yeah, now I'm whole, in a sense. You so found it, it, the answers uh, yeah, it was like, as a Muslim that you had as a Christian. Yeah, I had, I, yeah it was like I had uh, Christian questions and they were answered in an Islamic way. That is, <laughs> that is incredible sentence. I'm yeah. doing this. <laughs> um, <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, your your path is unbelievable. Uh, I have to ask you this, Yoram. Um, 
uh, the Netherlands has taken 10% responsibility for genocide in Srebrenica, genocide against Muslims in, in my country, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I remember when living in the Netherlands and Geert Willis was there, and I wrote a couple of letters trying to explain, hey, you know, you're dividing our community, you know, that escaped the war and came to the Netherlands, and, you know, it's not correct what you're saying, at least let me correct you, if, if nothing. And uh, what do you know about the genocide in Srebrenica? Um, and um, has your opinion changed during your journey uh, from being Christian to, to Muslim? And has it had any effect on your understanding on what had happened on European soil uh, 27 years ago? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, of course, it was a horrible genocide uh, uh, that that took place uh, over there long ago. Um, and yeah, it's of course very. Uh, it's, it's 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 yeah. It's very. It's something to be ashamed of as a as a country that you um, let that happen because that what that's what happened. Of course, uh, the, the the Dutch uh, battalion of the of the United Nations should protect it, the the people over there, and they didn't. They just gave them to the to the enemy, and they were all killed in the, in the most horrible uh, and cowardly way. So it, it, it was it was it was horrible, of course. Uh, but when I, when I was in the Freedom Party, uh, the Freedom Party was much more about the national identity, national pride, etc. Well, you know it. Mm -hmm. So everything that was like contrary to the national narrative and the national pride there was something they said well that's not true or it's fake news or whatever or they just don't give us all the facts or whatever um but i wasn't a spokesperson on uh, foreign policy so i really in, in the media i never said something about it mm -hmm. but of course when you saw all these little children uh, without a father and a mother, sometimes even the children were killed. Yeah. yeah of course, it was horrible. And uh, after I became Muslim, of course, you, you dive into it even more uh, than back then. Uh, and, and now I think, I, and that has nothing, that's not so much to do with the fact that I became Muslim, because I know a lot of Christians and other people who also felt the same. Uh, that a lot of facts they weren't uh, weren't presented here in the Netherlands for a long time. Mm -hmm. It took years and years and years it before did. people. Yeah, they they opened it up did, yeah. files and 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 uh, our military was very uh, like hiding everything. Uh, yes, so I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember being uh, utterly <laughs> afraid and ashamed, in a way, to say that I'm Bosnian because the general opinion of the Bosnians was, oh, they're all Muslims, and you know they were slaughtered, and this is because of jihad, and it was completely distorted idea yeah. of European Muslims that are Bosniaks in this country that had to flee, that that were um, killed in genocide. It was completely distorted picture um, um, and that is uh, one of the one of the results of pay fe fe of the party for freedom uh, uh, acting I remember Rita Ferdonk uh, was uh, in power then as well I remember deporting so many people I mean it, it went to that extent it was it I remember that uh, however that has changed a lot in the Netherlands and there are groups there are organizations NGOs that, that are speaking for uh, the victims of genocide and the Hague tribunal is actually the Hague the, the UN tribunal uh, and all around the world and Europe there are organizations that are not particularly Muslim uh, that stand for the truth for those who died who were killed in genocide in Srebrenica and those who suffered during the war and um, how do you in in af now after your transition after your after your personal journey and your change how do you look upon the current affairs in the world? Let's say uh, Iran, um, the women fighting for freedom, or when we see the migrant routes and situation on the ground, when we see migrants from Middle East not being respected as migrants, for example, from Ukraine, you know, being pushed back uh, not to come into the Europe. And then we see in the UK, there's a in incredible sentiment, anti-migrant sentiment as well. How do you come into that? And th that is, the anti-migrant sentiment is pretty much based on racism and on Islamophobia. How, how, would, you, how would you classify that today as, as the Yoram that you are today? 
Yeah, well, I, when you look at uh, the whole um, fact that a lot of people are afraid of Islam, it really has to do with European culture in general. Um, because, uh, like, like we said in the beginning, there has been a lot of clashes between, especially the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and uh, and the West. And uh, with the West, I mean uh, Western Europe, but also Eastern Europe. So, uh, Islam, in a way, was always the historical enemy. And uh, when you look at uh, the culture nowadays, for example, in 1683, long time, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, there was this last big fight, the Battle of Vienna. And then the Ottoman Empire lost this fight against the Christian Europe's uh, Europeans. And what did the Europeans do? They baked bread and they shaped it in a half moon. And there was to show people that they fought against the Muslims and that they won and they broke ha the half moon, like the crescent moon, that was the symbol of Islam, and they broke it. Uh, and the, 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 the sandwich that was shaped in a half moon is still there, it's the croissant. Mm. And it's not like a boycott for the croissant or a call for the boycott because it's a very nice sandwich. But uh, the fact that it's still there is because a lot of people, and most of people don't know this story, of course, but it, it shows how uh, this symbolism against Islam is also unconscious in European culture because uh, Abdul Hakim Murad wrote a book, it's called Traveling Home, it's his latest book. And in this book, he explains the first time that Europeans called themselves Europeans. And it had to do with a fight in the year 732, so very, very long time ago. And uh, the oldest text that we found the written text where Europeans call themselves Europeans is about this battle. This battle was against the Muslims in Spain and in the north of, in the middle of France. And uh, the, the people who wrote the text said, we are everything that they are not. So they, the Europeans said, well, we are very different from each other, but at least we are not them. And them meant mm -hmm. the Muslims. It's even written literally. So the first time Europeans start identifying themselves is as non-Muslims. So there it's really at the yeah. core. It's really at the core. It goes and then way of course, back. It's, it, it's hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and, and more than a thousand years ago even. So it's really in the heart of Europe to say Islam is not part of who we are. And that's very. That's a very strong sentiment. Even people who really don't know about Islam, I don't care. It's just in the culture. All these little, for example, we have like uh, symbols for your own community like a state symbol. For example, when you look at uh, symbols of the Netherlands, you always see a lion. Yeah. And when you look at Amsterdam, you see three crosses, right? Yes. Three, yes. three white crosses. And so, but there is also, there are a lot of um, um, cities here that have symbolism that goes against Islam. And even the people don't know. Yeah, for example, you have a duck. I never thought about it that way. I never thought yeah, about it. it. I, I lived yeah. in Rotterdam for a very long time, and it's the three crosses. I never thought about it that way. I never thought about yeah. the lion, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch emblem that we see on the embassies. I never thought about it that way. You see, you really got me thinking now. Uh, yeah, and, and so it's way is, deeper than we think. It's way deeper than we think. Yeah, and, and those are like, say, like uh, so to say, general um, symbols. But there are really symbols that go against Islam. For example, there is a lot of cities that have a duck, look, the, the, the bird, yep. without a beak and without feet. And it was a symbol that was given to families who fought during the Crusades against the Muslims. And the, the, those symbols were given to, uh, to those families. They were very powerful families. And some of them, the, those families, even became the owners, so to say, of the cities. Uh, one example is Kuik. Kuik is a very small city in the south of the Netherlands, near Limburg. Um, but it's still there, and that symbolism is still there. So a lot of people don't know it, but it's all over the place. And if you know about this, it's it's really rooted in who we are almost. So uh, that makes makes people receptive for Islamophobia. There you go. And of that, course, yeah. Yeah, around yeah. 25 million Muslims live now in European Union with 28 members. Um, yeah. They're systematically uh, and systemically being segregated and, and um, discriminated against. Uh, the majority of the people there have ended up unemployed uh, due to misperceptions uh, and uh, prejudgments, prejudice of European Muslims who are considered 
so-called a threat to European societies and uh, their domestic security because of an increase in radical activities and attacks by a, um, a fringe minority, uh, which is also pay, pay, pay. Not that I have anything against it. I mean, let's let let's face it. But it did divide uh, the entire communities in in uh, the Netherlands. It did bring a lot of segregation and a lot of fear of the unknown. And like you said, we fear things that we don't know about. So we need to educate ourselves, uh, uh, learn about it in order to accept things as, as they are. Um, today... Well, and, and, mm -hmm. and it's like you said, uh, when it comes to fear, uh, in the Freedom Party, and I know that's the same with, for example, Lega Nord, because it's a sister organization, in, and also the Danish Folks Party and Flemish Interest, and all those anti-Islam organizations. There is one big organization now in European Parliament, so it's an anti-Islam European organization in the Parliament. But what they always said, and that's something they copied from each other, they said people vote their fears, not their hopes. Mm -hmm. So when it's election time, people... Uh, people get scared when you say, well, there are a lot of migrants, uh, economy, this, whatever. So people get scared. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for the organization that will protect me. And they don't vote for the hope that, let's say, everybody gets free education or free health care or whatever. So people vote their fears. And, and those organizations know this. So it's like they're almost parasites in the political system. It's like a little bit like Bosnia. Uh, people vote for those who think they are going to protect them because the rhetorics are constantly war rhetorics and secession rhetorics and another bloodshed rhetorics. And people vote for those who think yeah. they will protect them because, you know, nobody talks about economy here anymore. <laughs> nobody talks about COVID here anymore. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same. This is a, although very beautiful country. Uh, are you ever planning to come visit Bosnia and Herzegovina. There are so many uh, things in common that we have. Um, it would be really nice for you to come visit Sarajevo and maybe even visit Srebrenica, um, one of the places where the worst atrocities happened uh, after World War II. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it will be beautiful, of course. Perhaps uh, uh, next summer or something. Uh, you have an invitation. You have an extended invitation. You and your family. <laughs> You're always welcome here. I'll help you guys out to to navigate your way here. It would be really nice if you, if you could do make the journey, and oh, <laughs> because you were mentioning the Ottoman Empire and Austrian Hungarian, you do know that Sarajevo is a city where World War One yeah. was parked. <laughs> so there's so much history. I think. I think you would yeah. definitely love it here. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, would, we would love to have you. What would your message be to our audience? Our audience is very mixed. Uh, we um, air in the entire region, including Serbia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Um, for example, just Sarajevo is a very multinational city, multi-religion city. We're Muslims, uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, Catholics, and uh, J uh, Jewish um, and, um, groups live, uh, nations live. Um, so what would your message be as Yoram that you are today? And I keep saying that, Yoram, that you are today uh, <laughs> to them. To them, uh, when it comes to forgiveness, acceptance, and and you know education. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, I think I'm the last person on this world. Oh, no, you're not. Can, you know, <laughs> when it comes to uh, politics and uh, their views. I, of, I think I totally other. broke you with that thing when I said you're the you're the guilty one because I left the country, right? <laughs> no, you're not the last person. No, seriously, I appreciate you so much, and it's such an honor. So your opinion and and your message would really, really be um, really appreciated. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, when, I, when I look at my own uh, personal journey, I think it's very important to try to look at what the other person says about himself before you start believing what you think about the other. So if you really don't know the other person for real, so try to understand what the arguments of the other are in a very open uh, way and try to respect the other for who or uh, he or she is, I think that that will uh, give you so much uh, space in a sense to find each other. And um, 
that's that's really what happened to me because I always had this idea of the Muslims of Islam and it really changed my views when I really dove into the the uh, the narrative of the Muslims themselves and of course uh, I, I don't say that everybody should become Muslim uh, it's, it's a personal thing I would say to everybody do because it makes you more happy but if people are Christian or uh, Catholic Christian or Orthodox I don't it doesn't matter of course but e everybody should try to see what the other sees uh, because I think that that gives you so much um, uh, space to 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 really talk to each other other instead of fighting and fearing each other i think it's very important to know the other person uh, yeah. and, and i wish that for everybody of course and i open the dialogue that we have opened now uh and and which i'm really grateful for yoram thank you so much for taking this time to tell us about your journey and to tell us about how everything went down because uh, we wrote a lot about you in the past couple of years and it's such an honor to have you on our show. Well, thank you very much again and for the kind words and the, the honor was all mine. It was uh, great to be uh, on your show and perhaps uh, we'll see each other in the we'll future. We'll see each other and then we'll speak in Dutch. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Oren. Good afternoon. <laughs> bio je to Joran von Klaverem, bio je naš gost, specijalni gost N1 televizije. Vi svakako ove informacije možete pronaći na našem sajtu n1info.com. Kao i na našim društvenim mrežama, ostanite svakako uz program N1 televizije.